So hi, um, I'm Matteo. I like decoupled architectures, and uh, I've been involved with this kind of architecture for quite a while now. Um, I think it was kind of three years ago uh, in one of my internal reviews at Lullabot, um, said my, my boss asked me, what would you like to do <coughs> next year? And I said, I would like to get into an API-first project. Uh, that happened, and, uh, and yeah, and now I'm gladly presenting about this stuff. Uh, Lullabot is a digital agency. Uh, we do uh, not only Drupal, we love Drupal, but we do other stuff like content strategy, um, design, we do React, we do a lot of JS stuff uh, for uh, clients like uh, MBC, universities, etc. And they paid for my trip here, and I'm very grateful. So if you have the chance, come by the booth. So in this session, I will be happy if you come out of it and you have learned about uh, some of these topics, uh, JSON API, what it is and when to use it or why to use it in the first place. Um, a Drupal module, uh, we wrote a, a Drupal module. Um, I, I hear it's working fine, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna give a, an update on the status of the, of the things that we have pending, other things that uh, we implemented and why we did it this way and the, the limitations and how it compares with other solutions like resting core or um, either, uh, even the GraphQL module. Um, and finally, some of the outstanding problems that we have in the decoupled world. Um, not just uh, for JSON API, but also for many other decoupled architectures. Uh, there are tricky problems. Uh, some of those have solutions, some others have hacks, uh, and I will talk about that. Hopefully it's no, not gonna be rushing through it because it's towards the end. So um, JSON API, their motto is that they, JSON API paints your bike shed. And that is because, I, I don't know if you ever had to uh, design an API, uh, but that is something that everyone has an opinion on. Like, what's the name of the property that's gonna be there? How are you going to structure the JSON object? Or how are you going to interact uh, if you're gonna use REST or not? So JSON API takes that off your way because it's an opinionated specification and it tells you what to do and the discussion ends there. So uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, I've been experiencing success with that, with that bike shedding, stopping there. So uh, basically what it does, it, it defines the transport format of a JSON object and also the interaction on how you, how you communicate with the, with the server. So um, JSON API is uh, a specification, a particular specification that uh, tells you how to do things from the server perspective. So then consumers can make assumptions and work on that. And uh, by building a standard, what we're building is an ecosystem of tools that can be used. So uh, don't look at this too much, because we're gonna go into detail uh, a little bit, but first I want to, um, to make a note on the fact that JSON API, it's a, it's a specification, it's a document, and it's a Creative Commons document, which is kind of the closest that you can get to open source when you don't have source code and uh, it's completely open, uh, and uh, most importantly, it was developed and run by UX and front-end experts, because I am a back-end developer, and I like things that like, kind of cover all the corners that are very academically correct, um, but those things are not the things that uh, are the most easy to use, right? So, these people, um, basically, what they did is they have been experiencing some pain using uh, other specifications, and that they, they did their wish list. Uh, so what this tells us is that this is something that is designed to be used. It's designed to be easy to use. So why this one? Because there are many, right? 
Um, so one, one of the arguments would be uh, the one that I just said, that it's easy to use, right? Um, another argument could be um, that, well, when you see uh, and you compare this with the many specifications that are out there, and I'm not listing all of them here, uh, there, are, there are many more, and this is only talking about REST specifications. You can see that JSON API is not doing too good compared to other like Uber or Basin or whatever. Um, one of the good things is the only stable specification that there is out there, like the only modern uh, specification on top of REST. And, um, and it works really well, especially because, as I said before, when you set a standard, you can then build an ecosystem of tools that can help you leverage all this, all this information. So uh, why this one? It's because it's insanely popular. There's a lot of software built around of JSON API. Uh, it's not just in the Ember community, although it started from the Ember community, um, but there are like more than 141 repos, and this is just taking uh, their site, uh, and I know that there are many, many repos that are not listed there. For instance, the Drupal module is not there. Uh, probably should be there, um, but it is not. Um, and also, whatever your language is, uh, your preference is, there are integrations with JSON API. Like, there are more than 18 programming languages that uh, interact in one way or, no or another with JSON API, and uh, you have both client-side and server-side implementations. Like, you have uh, React <laughs> integrations with JSON API, and you have uh, in the front end, and you have in the back end, Drupal integrations with JSON API. So that makes it really easy to get that 80% done so you can focus on what is important, which is adding value for your project. One of the things that we learned uh, last DrupalCon is uh, how by reusing and making these assumptions, uh, you can build something like the CARDS CMS, uh, which uh, I don't know if you saw that, that presentation last year, but it, it was pretty amazing to see uh, how seamlessly the communication worked uh, from this Ember application and, and a Drupal site using JSON API. Um, so that's, that's what we gain. Uh, another good thing that I like about the specification is that it's not, uh, it doesn't control too much what you need to do. It kind of gives you room and flexibility. Like for instance, um, I like to highlight the, the filters idea. Uh, so in JSON API, you can have filters and uh, what all that they say is that when you do filters, you are going to specify the keyword filter in the, uh, in the query string, and that's it. And uh, that's because every, every server has its uh, idiosyncratic uh, implementations of uh, filtering, right? Uh, in Drupal, we have an, the entity query API, and we can query any entity and relationship between entities, and it's super powerful, but we need some way to express that as part of JSON API. And uh, JSON API doesn't tell you how you need to do filters, because otherwise we would be in a corner trying to do kind of uh, weird mappings, right? Um, so what we did is, since we have this room inside of the filters parameter, we specified in the Drupal module uh, what is the filter strategy that we're gonna use. So now we end up with uh, an, a specification that's JSON API that specifies almost everything, and then our specific stuff, which is the Drupal filtering extension. So by providing those, you kind of provide full documentation on how to, on how to use this. Um, so yeah, the, the extension system is pretty nice. Um, also, it, it is kind of uh, useful when you follow a particular a specification uh, when implementing an API. It is very nice to be able to just send the front-end developer to the documentation, uh, not, not because you don't have time for that, but because the documentation and the specification is kind of more detailed on what 
you can and you cannot do with JSON API. So now your server uses JSON API, so you can just point them by giving them a, by giving them a link, and, and that's it. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting. That cleared a lot of uh, support requests from my play at least. And so why, why am I uh, passionate or I like JSON API? Uh, that's because uh, before I landed there, I, I started with, uh, with the decoupled project, uh, the one that I, I was mentioning before. Um, so we basically ported the, all the Drupal ideas and we made a JSON out of it and we sent it to the client and we rendered that in, um, in a Backbone app, I think it was back then. Um, yeah, Backbone. And, and that worked well. I mean, there was a lot of success in that project. It was a single website, uh, it was decoupled, and uh, by just making things JSON and sending it over the wire, we got it done. Uh, but then the same happy client wanted a second project and we wanted to use the same API. And we realized that we couldn't use it because there was a lot of presentation details encoded in our API. And, uh, and that was a problem because uh, now we wanted to show things differently while serving one side. We wanted to, sh to serve a second side, but it had a different design and we had fields that said uh, position title on the left and a background color red and that didn't work for the new design so we had to choose either one or the other so basically we had to redo the API, learn from our mistakes and we did this second project. Uh, it also went well uh, until we got the third project <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at that point um, I mean, I wanted to see what all the people were doing, right? Because this cannot be just me having these problems, right? Uh, I should have done that before, uh, but hey, I did it at the end, right? Um, so basically, that's when I discovered JSON API. I uh, debated on using JSON API or how. Uh, by the time GraphQL was not on the table, and uh, we went with JSON API, we never missed any other feature before because all the problems that I was having are known problems and those known problems have known solutions. And either you use JSON API or uh, another advanced uh, system, you're gonna have the same known solutions applied to it with some other flavors, right? Uh, in JSON API, you interact differently uh, with, the, with the API than with all the solutions, but in the end, you, uh, you sure solve the same problem, so uh, implement the same solutions. So let's talk a little bit about the JSON API format. I'm gonna rush a little bit through this because uh, uh, I don't think that this is uh, very interesting. Uh, this is just format, right? Um, so basically there are like four parts. I encoded them with colors. The blue part is the resource information. It, this is what identifies a particular resource. Like it can be like for instance, a type collection and then the ID uh, number 23, right? Um, so yeah, that's pretty easy. Then there is the actual data, uh, the attributes and relationships uh, that, that you have inside your that inside of your entity, the inside of your resource entity. And finally, we have the, the yellow part, which is metadata, which is kind of talking about the data that you're exposing, things like this resource was loaded in 0.75 milliseconds, or you know, that's too fast probably. Um, but, but yeah, you also have like links, things that are related to each other and uh, and this kind of metadata. And finally, you have some glue code to put everything together. So it looks like this. Um, the, there is the, the part with the uh, identifying the resource, and this part to identify a resource is gonna be reused in the relationships, because in a relationship, you point to another resource, right? Uh, that's what a relationship is. And, uh, then you have attributes and relationships, and inside of that, you have just the key values. Uh, so it's very readable. That's, uh, 
that's what I was saying when uh, I was saying that it was designed by UX designers and front-end developers. They want it to be usable. They don't want here an array of uh, name equals whatever and value equals whatever. If it's an array, then it's just plain simple. In here, I'm just setting uh, a string, but this could be whatever. This could be a JSON object. And the relationships are kind of uh, fractal in the sense that they contain the both the sorry uh, all of the four colors inside them. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you have the key, uh, the name of the relationship, and then the uh, ID of the thing that they are pointing to. So th this is pretty much it. Um, so you can see it's easy. You may be confused because uh, I went probably too fast, but. Uh, I guarantee that if you stare at this uh, at this format for 15 minutes, uh, you'll be the master of it. Uh, so, <laughs> resource interaction is even easier. It just uses REST, right? Um, the goal of this talk is not to talk about REST. Probably uh, you are uh, already tired of. Uh, of hearing about REST, uh, but it's basically using HTTP verbs to do actions on uh, the <coughs> resources. And uh, for us, like to get us in the mindset, resources are kind of just entities for, for us, right? Uh, we kind of use the same name. They, uh, in the REST world, uh, they use the word entity, and we do as well. So uh, it's kind of the same, the same thing. Um, so this is what it looks like. You make a get request and you get a response. Um, pretty much that simple. The only thing is that uh, you kind of you can pass at least in in the Drupal module is uh, kind of optional. You you pass an accept header saying, hey, this list of articles, I want them in the format API JSON. And that's uh, and that's that. Uh, so we said that we had typical problems. We didn't talk about those problems, um, nor the solutions. So the big problems are um, related to, um, to three big topics. One is that uh, in REST, typically, we have multiple requests to the backend, right? And by having multiple requests to, to the backend, uh, what we are doing is uh, we are slowing things down because we have uh, multiple times the HTTP latency from going from uh, my phone in that mountain with low coverage in 3G to whatever server I'm hitting, right? Um, so if you do that multiple times, it's gonna hurt performance. Um, also, when you, s when you get an entity in REST, you get the whole thing, the whole th Everything or nothing. It's like when you get the entity, Drupal goes bleh, and gives you everything that's there, right? And finally, this con content discovery. Um, the, this is kind of a, uh, an interesting thing because we are so used to having listings and being able to find uh, every piece of content, but uh, that's because Drupal is pretty awesome, and uh, that is not trivial. In, in other places. Things like, uh, I know how to access article 12, but I don't know how to get all of the articles. So, um, so those are the, the big problems and those are the, the solutions. Um, so let me highlight those by going through this extremely uh, simple example. And believe me, your project is gonna be way more complex than this, right? Um, but the, the example is uh, that there is a, a blog and uh, my friend Paco wants to do this blog. And, the, and he likes to talk about front-end development because he's a front-end dev and uh, he's also vegan and wants to talk about that and cats as well. And he wants to write a blog in kind of this manner. This is the, this is the mocks that he has. Uh, it, there is a title, there is an image for the author, there are comments. Uh, a list of tags with the name of the tag and then link to somewhere else uh, related to that tag and also the images of the authors of the comments, etc. So uh, this is not a radical design, right? This seems pretty simple. Uh, so when he starts doing this with 
uh, typical REST, he says, okay, I know that this is Article 12, so I'm gonna load that, and when I load that, I'm gonna load uh, the author, and when I load the author, uh, I will know uh, that the author has a, a picture, and I will download that. So you can see how quickly that super simple example escalates in the number of requests. But the worst part of this is not the number of requests, but uh, what I have here represented by the indentation levels. You can see that there are three, sorry, four indentation levels here in nine. That means that in order to get the information that we want about the, art, the image of the author of the comment on the article, we need to do four sequential requests. That means that we need to wait for four requests to go to the server and back. And that's what's bad. Uh, so in JSON API, we simplify that by saying to the server, uh, well, that looks simpler. Um, when you get the article, just include these relationships. Follow the relationships and include the response all in one go. So you make one single request and you get all the data that you need. So uh, that's resource embedding. You are embedding other resources in your initial request. Um, so uh, that's how you would solve that. Um, the idea of kind of limiting what you get back, Im imagine that uh, he wanted to get only for uh, articles, because now we know that when you request an article, you can get also information about authors and tags, right? So you specify the fields for the articles that you return uh, are only the title and the creation date. So it's basically, it's just that. This is the idea. You get uh, only what you care. So you get all that you want and only what you want in one single request. Uh, and that is pretty powerful. So the last thing that, um, that we said we, we were talk, talking about was uh, collections. So imagine, I'm gonna switch the example. Uh, imagine that you're implementing a record label uh, and you want to do something like this. Uh, give me the cover image and the publication year of all of the albums of all of the bands having one of the members under 35 currently living in Murcia, which is a beautiful region in Spain. And uh, you can say, oh, while you're at it, I'll put the name of the band and the members as well. So that sounds like a lot, right? But what, what we're saying there is that we want a list of bands and we want to select not all of the bands, but only those bands that one of the members is under 35 and lives in a particular city, right? And then we are also including, we know how to do includes, and we are also know how to select fields. But the important part here is that we are filtering. And this is a complex filter, because we are not filtering, we are filtering bands, but we are not filtering on any property on the band. We are filtering on properties on the members that belong to that band, right? So um, the way that you would do this is uh, you would use the keyword filter um, and you would say the members, the city member is set to Murcia. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you will get all of the bands that have a member that lived there, right? Or at least that uh, you set in Drupal that lives there. And, um, and you could also add on top of that another filter that says the age of, of the members has to be, you set it to 35, and then you set the operator to less than. So uh, when that gets uh, interpreted, it gets set to less than 35. Uh, so that's it. Then we do some includes, we do some fields, and, uh, and again, you get a collection with all of the items that you need that contain all of the data that you need and only the data that you need. And this is, um, and this is what JSON API is all about. So I don't know if you noticed, but that sounded pretty much like a query to me. Like uh, the fields are kind of the columns in a SQL statement. 
uh, that includes our joints and the, the filters are the wear. So that's what we're doing. We are empowering the consumers to do advanced queries on our system so we can have them build the data that we need, that they need. So this is the, this is the crucial concept. If you walk away with anything out of this session, just remember this. The consumers are the ones that specify their data needs. You as a server or as a backend engineer, you don't have any business saying this is how you will display data. This is uh, unfortunately not a monolithic approach where you can click a view together and say uh, this is how you're going to get the data. No, they are, because uh, my Xbox application is going to have a radically different design than my iPad app. And maybe my um, Android app is completely different from my iOS app. And I don't even know if I open up my API, what someone can do with my API. So what, what am I doing saying that uh, something needs to be displayed in a particular way. So that kind of reverses the roles, and it's not the server anymore saying, uh, I'm going to click these filters together for a view, and this is what you get, but it's the other way around. It's the consumer that decides what data they need to implement their design, and they ask for it. And uh, basically, that kind of, uh, as a backend developer, that's kind of cool, because all the work is there. So. <laughs> uh, there is a, like a, a final thing on JSON API. I'm not going to go through this, but there are like for every resource, four different endpoints. Uh, there's the related data endpoint and the relationship data endpoint. Uh, go and look into, into the specification, and, and you, will, you will learn more about it. I'm not sure if you know this, but I just sent you to the manual. So I said that there is a performance gain, right? Um, let's, let's talk about that. So um, I did a very simple test, and please don't chastise me on how simple this performance test is, because uh, I'm aware of it, right? But I'm just trying to make a point. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm selecting an article, uh, 2100, and I'm including the author and the image of that article. And also, I'm including two tags, uh, just for fun, because we know that the slow path is going to be uh, the three sequential requests, right? But I'm going to select the two tags. Uh, and I'm going to compare that with, um, with resting core. And uh, in that case, we need to make those sequential requests. Uh, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to bother to do these two tag requests, because we know they are not in the critical path. So this is what it takes uh, with page cache uh, in, uh, in full motion and uh, using my local to make this test it takes 21 milliseconds, which is pretty good, right? Um, but you notice that here, if we have more sequential requests, the performance gets worse, right? Um, while if we use a uh, modern technique like uh, JSON API does with embedding resources, uh, we get a flat around seven milliseconds. And that's three times the performance. But it's not only three times the performance, because if we had like nine levels of indentation, it would be nine times better. Um, so this kind of uh, is uh, stable, this performance gain is stable if you uh, get uh, anonymous traffic cached by page cache or authenticated traffic uh, cached by dynamic cache or even uncached traffic. So it's kind of um, a very, uh, I would say that uh, it's fairly safe to say that the performance is, is better and it's a linear gain. Uh, so there are more details on how I did this in that gist there, if you're curious. Um, but yeah, uh, basically what we are doing here is we avoiding Drupal to bootstrap multiple times to get to the data.
right? Uh, but it's not only that, right? Because uh, again, if I'm with my uh, very bad signal on my phone and I need to do the round trip to the server, uh, maybe it takes 300 milliseconds. And if you have to go nine times and do 300 milliseconds, that's three seconds to load instead of 300 milliseconds plus seven milliseconds, right? So uh, it is really important. And uh, I would say that without something like this, without resource embedding, uh, with JSON API or with something else, uh, the performance in a decoupled app is, you know, is just not acceptable. So you need to do some of this. Uh, so let's talk about the, um, the Drupal module. Um, so basically, the Drupal module has been, uh, oh yeah, uh, that's where you download the, the Drupal module. Uh, basically, the idea of the Drupal module is that it's zero configuration. So you download the Drupal module, you enable the Drupal module, and you're done. You have a fully functional, full feature JSON API server. So um, that means that uh, not only you're able to interact with the entities, it's not just reading, right? We're not talking here only about reading data. My examples were about reading data, but uh, we are also going to have to need to write data to delete entities, to update them, et cetera. Um, so uh, you, can do, uh, you can do all of that uh, by, by default. It also integrates with whichever authentication provider uh, you have enabled in your system. And you, if you add a new one, it gets added to, to the list. So if your request is eligible to authenticate, uh, then it gets authenticated. Uh, it's, it's that simple. Um, it's tied to the entity system. And uh, this kind of was a, uh, not a heated discussion, because it's uh, it's hard to have a heated discussion with WIM layers. But uh, it, it, it was an interesting discussion on if we wanted to limit ourselves into the entity system. And uh, we said yes, and uh, I'm very happy that we, that we did, because uh, um, that kind of reduces complexity and makes the module more stable. Um, so yeah, it integrates with the uh, there is full accessibility metadata support. Uh, you saw before that we uh, did uh, a performance test with a dynamic page cache, uh, which indicates that we have that support. And uh, it works really well with computer fields. Uh, so things that you want to add extra to your API, just create a computer field, and it works. Um, and we took the stance to also make a one-to-one -one mapping to resources to bundles, right? Uh, that means that the, there is a different resource to get articles, and there is a different resource to get pages. They, there is no such con concept of getting a node. And that's because if I ask you, what is the list of fields in node 45? You don't know. And that's because you, you don't know if it's an article, a page, or whatever. Uh, you can only derive a full schema from a bundle, right? Um, and that's why we decided to go with the idea of tying the resources to, to bundles. That has the unfortunate limitation that you cannot make a listing that kind of intermixes articles and pages. Uh, I don't think that that's very useful. The, I mean, there is that use case. Um, but you can make the two requests, maybe, uh, with that. Um, I haven't found uh, a use case for selecting all of the bundles on an entity type that was kind of, uh, that would justify going that direction. Uh, so what can we, what do we gain uh, as part of that? Um, what we gain is that we can create a schema. And there, is a, and there is a module called Schemata, 
and uh, that module has now full support for JSON API, and the full support for JSON API, uh, what we'll give you is a document. Uh, it is also JSON, but it's just a document that explains the shape of the JSON API output. So it kind of tells you uh, that there is a data property that contains a list of, for, for an article, for instance, that contains a list of properties that, let's say, an NID, that NID is an integer, uh, that contains a body. The, that body is an object that contains value, which is a string, format, which is another string. So the use of that is that you can generate automatic documentation. And uh, by generating automatic documentation, uh, you get the ability to uh, just make sure that you have your documentation up to date. So when you create a field in Drupal, the documentation is for your API is automatically updated. Uh, so the consumers, the front-end developers, can just go and look at the documentation and trust it and know that and they know that it's up to date, and they don't have to go and make random calls to your API to inspect the data that they, got, they, they get back to see, oh, I see that the body is not uh, a string, it's an object that contains uh, the key value, right? Because they have here uh, what they need. And uh, this human readable uh, output here that you see is uh, created by uh, a small project called Doxon that it just slaps some JavaScript on top of the, on the schemata output. Um, so that's what, what you can do with, um, with the schema. Oh, you can also generate automatic forms because uh, now you know that the title is a string, that the article has a title that it's a string. So you can pass that to a software that writes automatic forms for you. The cool thing is that you add, if you add a Boolean in your back end, your front end can automatically create a checkbox for that. So um, you can also validate your input. So if you're gonna send a JSON blob to create a comment, for instance, if you have downloaded previously the schema for comments, you can just validate that the thing that you're sending is useful, is valid, and that you didn't miss one of the required fields, etc. You can do more things. You can generate, uh, you can even generate boilerplate code. Uh, so uh, this software here, what it does is it generates Go models based on JSON API, sorry, on JSON schema data. So um, you can kind of get your a start, uh, you, you can get a jump start on your, on your project by generating code automatically. So you can see that you can do a lot of stuff by generating a schema. And we can only do that because we know that we are going back to a Drupal bundle. Uh, and that's when we can generate the schema. Some of the limitations are um, the file integrations, they need work. Uh, they also need work in Drupal core, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that we, we need to, to get there. Like uploading a binary file is uh, a still kind of in a, in a rough place. Um, getting also uh, image derivatives uh, working uh, so the consumer can select which image they want. Uh, is also kind of uh, difficult. Uh, it's limited to the entity system, so you cannot, for instance, expose uh, DB log entries, which is something that you may want to do, uh, but you can't. Uh, we gain too much from limiting ourselves to the entity system that this is kind of a, you know, a pros and cons, right? Uh, it's a good limitation, but still limitation. Um, and extensible through code only is no, that's no longer true. Because uh, uh, thanks to American Airlines, actually, because uh, they canceled my flight and I got some extra time. And, 
and got this this worked um, a little bit. So it's th that module is still not there yet, um, but but I'm really excited because uh, it kind of ties back to this triple philosophy of empowering site builders, and this will allow you to kind of modify some of the things, edit the default routes, uh, rename some properties, disable some fields, because sometimes you don't care about the content translation status field, right? Especially uh, in, in the US. You do it all, all in English. Uh, so, uh, well, that's not fair. Um, but anyways, uh, you get the idea. Uh, sometimes you don't care about the uh, version ID field. Um, so, yeah, there are some op open challenges. Um, things that are very complicated, like uh, should we take a stance and do some image derivatives in the server on how we think that an image should be uh, cropped and displayed in the in the consumer, I think we shouldn't, but uh, again, uh, we don't want the consumers to download your uh, eight megabyte picture, right? So we need to do something there. Uh, so that is an, one of the open challenges. Um, there are uh, other challenges like uh, what happens when you want to do this trick of doing multiple requests to the server, but for write operations. Um, uh, there is no good answer in, in the JSON API module. Uh, I wrote a, a module that kind of will take a blueprint of requests. Uh, it's, it's usable, but still uh, it has its own limitations as well. So, uh, well, there are, there are a bunch of things that uh, are tricky. Like we get, uh, we can get, a date in a format that we don't want. Maybe we, do we want in ISO, uh, in the ISO format, uh, in on the client's basis. Like I want to be able to specify the format of my dates, uh, and that is something that uh, we are not there yet. So if you want to contribute to any of this stuff, uh, please come to the sprints. If you don't want to contribute to any of this stuff, come to the sprints and work in something else. Um, but especially if you're a first-time contributor, uh, I think it's amazing. Like, the mentor sprints are, uh, like, one of the best parts of the, of the DrupalCon. Before I go, I want to say thanks to, uh, to these people. I don't know any of them, but they made it, this presentation to be, uh, to be kind of beautiful. I like it. Uh, and so this is all Creative Commons stuff. So. Uh, thanks to them. And uh, if you like the session, please go and kind of evaluate it because um, this will help presenters. And this, this doesn't go only for, for this session. Uh, this will help presenters to uh, get a better chance to present in the future. And, um, and yeah, if you didn't like it, you can forget about it. <laughs> That's it. Ta-da. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this working? Is this working? No? Is it, it, working? It, it seems it is working. Okay, uh, so to clarify your question on, or clarify your sub request sub module, is that to work with queue and batch API requests? N so, since I'm not sure that that could capture, uh, I'm going to try to repeat the question. Um, is the sub request module uh, intended to work with queue, uh, batch API, et cetera? And the answer is no. Uh, it's, it's not that fancy. I mean, all, all that it does, it allows you to serialize or to send serialized HTTP requests and send a collection of them so Drupal can execute them all and return in one go. The only fancy thing that it does is that it will allow you to say, request number three expects request number one's output, so go to this property in request number one output and put it here 
in request number three. I, so is there a way of doing uh, queue or batch operations with JSON API, either the module or in the specification? Is there a way of doing uh, batch or queue API operations either in the Drupal module or in the specification? Not yet. And to be honest, I didn't think of that, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting feature. Just, this is working? Oh. Okay. Uh, just real briefly, I really appreciate locking it down to the entities uh, because I understand the convenience. But uh, the problem for me is that if 99% of my API is covered by that, uh, and then all of a sudden I need an API endpoint that doesn't, that is an entity related, and I have to give out to the client, to the consumers, a separate API endpoint, uh, that seems unusual. Is there like a wrapper or some solution you have for dealing with mixing the JSON API with something else uh, when, I, when I need to go beyond the entities? Yes and no. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea is that you still have REST in core to do all that, and it will allow you to create the JSON API output. Like uh, the example that I gave is about logging, but that is not very interesting because logs do not relate to anything, and nothing relates to logs, right? Um, so that is the big disconnect there. In order to traverse the, the data model tree and follow relationships and do queries of things that relate to things, like the example that I gave uh, on filtering on the members' data that belong to a band, you, if they are not entities, we, don't, we cannot use entity query to, to do that query. So y you can fake that it's JSON API. You can put it in a route that uh, is compatible with the rest, but you know, it will always be a little bit foreign to the rest of the data model, because it is. It's not an entity. Thank you. Hi, you said that the API has write capability as well inside of Drupal. Does that mean that I could use it for something like a syndication model where I have, let's say, 200 Drupal sites that I want to have them push to a central syndication server uh, to push out to either other services or for application uh, access or something like that? I don't see why you couldn't. Yeah, I think that you can. So I could, I could set up something like a, a, an on update push a JSON, uh, a get um, request over to the syndication server or something like that? Yeah, you would need to do some custom code, minimal custom code for that. But yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Do the, uh, the entities that it supports, is that uh, content entities as well as config entities, or are you limited to content? Ah, I should have said that. Yes, it's so, both. Okay. It's both. Good. So cool. you can, uh, if you're into that, you can update uh, the placement of your blocks from a remote place. Cool. Thank For you. instance, yeah. or do something useful. Uh, yeah, uh, my question's about permissioning on certain fields. Uh, say you have your band uh, explanation there. Um, if you had like the middle name of a member, but you didn't have access to that, how would your API, say you requested it, would you just get a 404 or a 401, or would you get all the data that you had requested that you had access to? Access control is trickier that you would expect, or at least what I expected. Um, so the thing is that um, when you're selecting collections and one of the items that uh, would be inside of that is 403, because it's not yet published, right? You don't want to fail the whole request, because there are legit items in there, yep. right? So. Um, I wrote an extension that is called partial success that will allow you to overall get the 200, but for those things that failed, you get uh, meta, uh, remember that we talked about the meta section? 
there is in the meta section it says, uh, by the way, there was a bunch of things that gave me a 403 or a 401. And in there, you kind of get that output. And if you are authenticated, it will even give you a stack trace in the JSON. Excellent. Thank you. Another question, another question I had was about removing Drupalisms from, from the API. Uh, front end developers that I work with uh, don't like, so, like when they see field underscore. And so in say Drupal 7, I have to, to write complex mapping and f to flatten APIs down uh, and, and complex uh, definitions. So is there a way to hook into uh, or alter the, the uh, uh, the input and the, you know, the request and response? There are three ways to do that. Uh, in level of inconvenience would be uh, hooking to the normalization system, right. uh, which, which is, I don't want to, right? <laughs> the, the other way would be um, field API lets you configure the prefix. So you could set the prefix to an empty string and have your fields named uh, correctly uh, from, from the start, which can have collision, uh, collision problems. Uh, and the last and uh, probably the option that you were uh, expecting is that that module that I said that I wrote recently and I'm going to publish will give you a configuration entity that kind of uh, is a companion of the resource and lets you do exactly that. It lets you rename every field from the UI, and you know, disable a resource or rename the route or whatever. Thank you. And I have a last question: Is um, if if we probably would be possible to to allow type data data types to be exposed through JSON API as well, although you know through some custom code. So is is that possible to to then expose and and use type data in the we lower level type data? We are using type data and exposing that when generating the schemas. So uh, what we are doing for to generate the schemas is we are using normalizers on the type data, not on the entity, but on the type data behind the entity. Right, the data definition. Right, exactly, the data, the data definitions. Uh, so it's not directly in JSON API, uh, but is accessible through a schemata. So if it would be possible to, um, instead of using entity queries, um, uh, have an endpoint to a lower level type data or um, a complex data that's not an entity, uh, which there are very few of, but is, it is a possibility. Um, and then, and, and maybe, you know, instead of going, you know, write custom code to, instead of going through entity field query, go through um, a, your own custom uh, data collection? It's not possible, and probably it's not gonna be possible, because I went that route in Drupal 7, and there is a lot of complexity that goes with that flexibility. Okay. But it should be extensible enough for uh, a separate contrib to allow that. <laughs>